Well, hello everybody. Welcome back to uh, once again another episode of Worship with CS. Finally, uh, sorry this time I kept you guys uh, waiting for a while, but um, I guess despite the delay, uh, I'm glad to have you back. So, uh, topic for today's video is actually uh, the newly introduced British battleships. Uh, obviously, as a uh, primarily battleship driver or slash specialist, uh, you know, this is quite an event, quite a big deal for me. Uh, I have always been tricked and seduced by, um, I guess, the glamour as well as the raw firepower, you know, these uh, beautiful monsters possess, if you will. And ultimately, historically, they were Marvel's engineering. Uh, and I would argue that, you know, Britain being a major naval power, as well as, you know, being the country that really innovated in many ways when it comes to naval technology, uh, the introduction of this tax rate line is quite a big deal. I originally wanted to release this video within about a week or two uh, after the introduction of these ships, because I wanted to show, you know, how these ships perform in their native state. Uh, before, you know, the player base move on from it, or much rather, you know, before Wargaming makes any changes to it. Because, you know, their, uh, you know, often misguided attempts to uh, micromanage and balance the game, you know, often lead to pretty disastrous results. So, I guess as a member of the player community, I feel compelled to, uh, you know, hold them accountable, if you will. But anyways, uh, let's, uh, let's get to the stats and details, if you will. So I guess, you know, in today's first replay, uh, I mean the HMS Orion, uh, obviously Orion class battleship. Uh, this was essentially the very first class of uh, British Super Dreadnoughts, built uh, within the preceding years before World War I. So, you know, give or take, this was essentially a state-of-art ship around maybe 1910. Of course, you know, there's, you know, somewhat various signs of uh, modernization done by Wargaming. To uh, bring the ship up to the standard of essentially the 1930s. Uh, when it comes to anti-aircraft fire, perhaps torpedo protection and, you know, little things like that. So you might ask, you know, what, what makes this ship a uh, super dreadnought? Uh, I guess one thing to consider, one thing to look at is the fact that uh, this ship mounts uh, 5 double 13.5 uh, inch uh, main battery guns all on the center line. Uh, in front of the ship, uh, the two turrets are stacked, so they're super firing. and. Uh, I believe the X and Y turret in the back are also super firing and stacked. And plus there's a middle turret, which is not all that uncommon uh, when it comes to, you know, designs of battleships, even up to the 1920s, if you will. For example, the Amagi, which is Japanese tier 8, still give or take half such a feature. I guess, you know, the fact that, you know, the main, uh, Battery's caliber is 13.5 inches, uh, essentially signified a major departure from uh, the standard design uh, showcased by previous uh, battleships, uh, such as Dreadnought and also pre-Dreadnoughts before them, which you know in British service had 12 inch guns, uh, in German service only had 11 inch guns as you see on the Nassau at tier 3. Uh, So, you know, I guess, you know, that's uh, the historical aspect and also, I suppose, kind of superficial if you're more concerned about gameplay. So, I guess what makes this ship special? Um, I would say that, you know, in terms of armor and mobility, the ship is good and not great. Uh, but, you know, in a sense, being good enough in those regards kind of provides you with a pretty decent foundation if, uh, if the ship is good with something else, if you will. Uh, Speed-wise, 
the Orion is capable of 22.5 knots, which makes it uh, somewhat slower than the Japanese and slightly slower than the German, but faster than the Russian and the American battleships at equal tier, which is, uh, I believe, the Nikolai and Wyoming and also Arkansas. But that's ultimately not a very fair comparison because uh, the German Kaiser was, at least in game, essentially a hypothetical World War II style modernization, which probably showcased a uh, modern power plant with significantly higher output than what uh, the historical power plant in World War I was capable of. So obviously the Kaiser can do 24 knots, give or take. And you know, if you compare between this and the Japanese ships, it's also not really a fair comparison. Because, uh, you know, the Japanese Miyogi, as well as the Premium, which is uh, Ikizumi or whatever that thing's called, uh, those are ultimately bottle cruisers with uh, a significantly thinner mean armor belt, about 200 millimeter give or take, versus the 300 millimeter you see on this, as well as most other uh, proper bottle ship at this tier. So sure, the Japanese bottle ships are faster, but uh, their design, you know, it's essentially a major compromise. And you know, the, the sacrifice the designer made in their design process might as well put those ships in a rather vulnerable spot in certain tactical situations. Such as, you know, uh, when you couldn't angry armor, uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, because ultimately, at the end of the day, the Japanese bottle ships can be penetrated by even cruiser armor piercing shells. Which, you know, really put them in a tough spot, if you will. So, uh... I guess, you know, in a street line, uh, the mobility is good, and uh, in, in, when it comes to turning, the ship does okay. And uh, armor, you know, it's superficially, superficially standard, as with, you know, most other bottle ship this tier. I think having a, essentially a 300 mm waterline belt, uh, some secondary uh, armor above the main belt and in front of the rear of the main belt. One thing to note about the armor design for the Orion is the fact that this ship's citadel essentially sits completely under the water. So, uh, one way to look at it is that, uh, you know, in a bra or in a close to medium range engagement, uh, if the enemy hits you on the, s the side of your hull, uh, or much rather your vertical armor with armor piercing shells, most likely, even if those shells penetrate your armor belt and enter the hull of your ship and detonate within the hull of your ship, uh, the, the location at which those shells detonate is above your main armor belt, and or much rather your citadel, and also your uh, main armor deck, if you will. You know, this kind of detailed explanation might sound kind of dorky and unnecessary, but in practice, you know, it really helps you a lot. And sometimes you might save your ass, because uh, by essentially uh, preventing the enemy from hitting your citadel, uh, you are essentially spared from taking uh, those very high damage rolls from those penetrations. But I guess, you know, perhaps the one standout feature uh, when it comes to the Orion is the fact that, you know, uh, he essentially has superb firepower for his tier. I mean, sure, superficially you can say that, you know, uh, the Wyoming, the Arkansas, and the Nikolai all have 12 guns versus the 10 you have here. But, you know, the guns on those ships are all 12 inches versus the 13.5 inch on this. And you might argue that, you know, uh, something like the Miyogi, for example, actually has 14 inch guns, which is a larger caliber. And, you know, the larger caliber may allow you to overmatch some armor. They may allow you to negate the angling of enemy armors. And they might provide more penetration. But I guess at the end of the day, you know, the Japanese 14 inches aren't really, in practice, meaningfully superior to the 13.5 inches you get on this ship. And uh, I guess perhaps one of the biggest wild cards and one of the biggest curveballs you should pay attention to and you might benefit from is the fact that uh, this ship, as with many other British battleships, as I will come to find out, uh, perhaps you have already found out, 
uh, in practice is the fact that uh, the high explosive shells fired by these ships essentially have excellent uh, performance. Um, you know, as the way they are in real life, uh, those shells essentially have a very large explosive filler for the caliber. Arguably, a large caliber than what you are used to uh, on any of the equivalent foreign ships, or should I say counterparts to this ship. And you know, another thing to consider is the fact that, you know, sure, you know, maybe your guns are capable of great damage, maybe they can shoot pretty far, uh, but are they accurate? Do they handle well? Are they easy to manage? And I would say that for the most part, uh, you know, they are. They're really solid. Um, accuracy is good. Shell velocity is decent in practice. You don't have to lead really far. Uh, you're not really dealing with the bottle ship equivalent of Cleveland's, which essentially have uh, guns that handle like mortars. I see very high arc and very long lead and very slow uh, shell velocity and very long air time, if you will, for the shells. So I guess, you know, one way to look at this ship is the fact that, you know, you can hit enemies very easily, and the guns do very solid damage. And, you know, one thing you might say is that, you know, okay, sure, the arm, uh, the high explosive shells are good, but ultimately armor piercing shells uh, generally have higher alpha roll. And that's true. But, you know, uh, there's always a degree of uncertainty, the RNG, to how the shells will perform when they're hitting a real-life target. Uh, they might shatter. They might hit a small patch of angled armor and bounce. Uh, they might hit the unarmored part of enemy ship and simply go through without detonating. Uh, so there's many possibilities regarding what armor-piercing shells will do when they do hit an enemy, at least in warships, that's the way they are now. Uh, but you know, with high explosive, you don't really have that degree of uncertainty. Uh, you hit the enemy with them. Uh, sure, the penetrating value for uh, high explosive is relatively limited, but uh, you splash the enemy and do some damage anyways. You can do some magic damage. You might knock out a torpedo mount, which, which is probably going to save your ass. Uh, you might take out the secondary mounts. Uh, most importantly, you might start a fire. Which is another really good thing about uh, British battleships so far for me. Is that you know they, they have a, a tremendous fire chance. Uh, I believe you know the chance in the high 30s and low 40s give or take. I have to go back and check. But in practice and you know statistically speaking, essentially, for every salvo you land on the enemies, if they're good salvos, if the majority of your shells actually hit, uh, most likely they're gonna start a fire. Sure, I mean, the, the shells that ended up in the water or that hit their main uh, armor belt is not going to start a fire. But still, you know, uh, the chance of fire starting is actually significant enough to be a major threat against the enemies. So, if you are fighting the enemy, a British battleship, uh, proper use and proper timing of the fire mechanic can really throw off the enemy's rhythms. You can hypothetically bait them into using the repair uh, module or much rather the repair consumable. And then you can start another fire in which they couldn't stop. Which means, you know, in the end, the fire will rage and um, their health will go down. Another thing that's interesting about British battleships that, you know, I'm sure some of the other YouTubers probably have already mentioned is the fact that uh, the armor piercing shells fired by uh, British battleships uh, seems to have a shorter fuse. That means they detonate more easily, and that means uh, in practice, if you're hitting enemies, uh, many penetrations that could have been over penetrations in which your projectile will pass through enemy ships and not detonate within your ship, but only after he has already exited enemy ship, or just not at all, it's just not gonna happen as much.
So sure, you know, you, you might say that, you know, with a short fuse, uh, your shells may detonate prematurely or may shatter and fail to penetrate when you hit some of the heaviest enemy armors. Uh, and, you know, that might be a drawback. But ultimately, if you're shooting an enemy cruiser or if you're shooting uh, enemy battleships, chances are uh, the shells that hit unarmored parts of enemy ships or under-armored parts of enemy ships will essentially do pretty solid damage uh, instead of simply over penetrating and do almost nothing. And ultimately, you know, I'm sure a lot of people will spend a lot of time talking about how uh, having a very strong mean armor belt is a big deal for battleships, but ultimately, even up to the Yamato at tier 10, uh, there's always going to be good chunks of the ship uh, that has no armor or minimal armor. You know, such as the superstructure, such as the stern, such as the bow, such as, you know, uh, parts of the hull above the main armor belt, uh, slash citadel, slash torpedo bulge. So, not only the armor piercing is devastating to cruisers and even sometimes to destroyers, but uh, they, they have no problem dealing damage to battleships at all. And we will consider the fact that uh, you can essentially start a fire and, you know, whittle down the enemy's health by burning them uh, and alternating between doing that and uh, spamming them with AP. Uh, you essentially have a meaning formula. And given the way things are in-game, you know, it's almost unbeatable. Nothing at this tier comes close. And quite frankly, you know, if you go up the tech tray, uh, such a feature and such an ability the British battleship possesses is also unparalleled. So anyways, uh, come to think of it, I will say that uh, the first two replay for today's video all come from, or should I say all came from, uh, the first three or four days of playing uh, in this ship. Negative. And you know, I think, you know, it's only more honest and more productive to show uh, the player base how the average game unfolds. Uh, how things, you know, behave on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, if you got a motorcycle and, you know, you're just gonna ride in a fucking parking lot, it's a bit of a lost cause. I mean, sure, you might go on the freeway and get plowed by a fucking dumpster truck, but, you know... I would say that, you know, perhaps you are at least making good use of your assets, despite the risk. <laughs> well, it is what it is. So I guess, you know, perhaps now is a good time to talk about the weaknesses uh, with Orion, and to extend, you know, these weaknesses as well as uh, the advantages uh, the ship have very much carries over to the Iron Duke at tier 5. You know, so much so that, you know, I think a lot of people kind of see these two ships as essentially being the same ship at different tiers with some minor differences. And, you know, uh, I kind of believe that kind of argument is kind of correct, or it's true to a pretty large extent. So, uh, I would say one big weakness for uh, the Orion, as well as the Iron Duke, is the fact that, um, you know, anti-aircraft firepower is not great. But then, you know, I, I don't think that's, that should be a surprise or that should be a subject of a major criticism, if you will. Because ultimately, you know, um, most battleships at this tier do not really have good firepower when it comes to anti-aircraft protection. I mean, the Wyoming uh, only have a bunch of three inches, uh, you know, 28 millimeter quads and uh, 50 caliber machine guns, which in game doesn't do much in comparison to uh, the 20 millimeter Arlequin and 40 millimeter Bofors you get uh, on higher tier ships. Uh, the Miyogi at this tier gets about 13mm machine guns as well as uh, four single barreled 120mm 
you know, which is really not enough. Especially consider how poor that ship turns and how long it is. It's just an easy target for uh, carriers. And um, I would say that you know, people take in practice uh, the AA power for the Orion is probably somewhat inferior than the Wyoming, and probably a little bit superior to the Japanese. So if you look at it, you have a bunch of quad 12.7mm uh, uh, machine guns. You have four dual 102mm uh, uh, dual purpose uh, AA guns. And uh, that's pretty much it. You don't have Orlicans, you don't have Warfors. Uh, you don't have the British pom pom on this ship. So, uh, I guess, you know, if confronted then focus on by enemy carriers, uh, they have no problem causing a lot of problem for you. Even though I would say that uh, because the fact that the ship is not as long as the Miyogi and it turns okay, uh, most likely a lot of times you might take some damage, but you'll be okay. Especially consider uh, the mid-tier carriers kind of got nerfed a couple of patches ago and they couldn't manual drop anymore. I kind of turn off seal calibers, plus me, if you will. Uh, aside from the limited AA performance this ship has, I would say another problem the ship might have is the fact that the main battery guns turn turn relatively slowly. Uh, without any modules and without uh, any captain skills, uh, these dual uh, 1345 inch main battery guns uh, rotates 180 degrees in 72 seconds, which is essentially glaringly long. I would say that, you know, a lot of these low tier uh, bottle ships tends to have a 60 uh, second rotation time for, you know, 180 degrees. If, if you go further up the tech tree, you might get ships uh, that essentially does that in 45 seconds. Of course, you know, some German battleships such as the Bismarck or the Nisno, can do even better. But you know, the quick reload small caliber gun and quick turret thing is, I guess, a German specialty from uh, tier 7 up. But I digress, I guess. I guess, you know, speaking of the handling characteristics, as well as the gun arc and, you know, actual performance of these guns. Uh, another thing that, you know, any new player or, you know, even any veteran players who are curious about the ship should definitely take note and pay attention to is the fact that, despite the fact that this ship has a, uh, a midship turret, which is located behind the smokestacks and main superstructure and in front of the secondary rear superstructure, is the fact that, you know, the gun arc is actually fairly wide. Concentrate fire on the target. And you know, such a trait might seem trivial for uh, people not in the know, but the reality is the fact that uh, having a wide arc essentially allow you more freedom in uh, when it comes to you know positioning your ship and angling your ship, and uh, which can actually you know allow you freedom of movement when it comes to your tactical positions as well as allow you to maximize the effectiveness of your armor. And because ultimately, when you do angle, uh, you know, you're presenting uh, effectively more armor to the enemies, just simply because the angle at which the enemy shells hit your ship uh, must go through more armor before they can effectively penetrate. And you know such an effect works on torpedoes too. You know, short torpedoes is essentially an underwater HE shell, it's a burst charge, but I mean, the thick, the thicker the effective armor you have, the less damage you take and the less likely you will fall out. And sooner or later, this is gonna add up. 
I guess, you know, if you want to quantify the degree of survivability this ship might have in practice, which means, you know, look at the health count and look at, you know, how much vigor room you have if you get into a prolonged uh, fight of attrition. Uh, I would say that, you know, the Orion does fairly okay. It's not a huge standout, but then, you know, most bottle ships at tier 4 aren't a huge standout. Or should I say aren't huge standouts, if you will. I mean, because, you know, one notable thing is about uh, bottle ships, uh, among the low tiers and mid tiers, is the fact that, you know, something like the Congo at tier 5 and the Fuso at tier 6 have a lot more health than uh, corresponding bottle ships, you know, in their tier. Meanwhile, the American Colorado at Tier 7 really suffers because, you know, it's a very stubby, chubby ship that has a lower uh, displacement. I suppose a compact silhouette. So I guess, you know, when it comes to health count, uh, the Orion's is kind of average. But given the fact that, you know, you have a pretty decent armor belt and the fact that uh, your citadels are covered, uh, for the most part, it's not that hard to stay safe. And in a sense, you know, the the good enough slash social social situation when it comes to the ship's survivability also very much applies to uh, the ship's mobility. I mean, because, you know, if you're used to playing American bottle ships in-game, you realize that, you know, when you lead it, they can usually manage barely 21 knots until you get to the North Carolina Tier 8. And uh, if you have to uh, work with them with the stock engine, you could be as slow as 18 or even less. You know, historically, it's always seen as not that much of a big deal because uh, I guess, you know, naval theorists, naval historians, naval tacticians thought that, you know, for a determined enemies, uh, engagement is inevitable. Uh, maneuvering and winning engagement is not really the end all. And that's why they uh, kind of negated um, mobility and agility uh, and focused on firepower and protection instead. I guess as you can see, uh, you know, on one side because they no longer have the manual drop ability and I had some help from the friendly carrier, uh, the enemy torpedo bomber squadron only managed my hit on my ship and their drop pattern was completely scattered because, uh, I guess, disruption caused by uh, friendly fighters. But you know, even then, you know, with friendly fighter help, my ship only managed to shoot down two enemy uh, aircrafts. Which in other words, it shows that, you know, if you're faced off against a determined enemy from there, uh, there's a good chance that, you know, your A is not going to be enough. But of course, you know, when it comes to captain skills, uh, I do not have AFT or BFT on this ship at all, because this was fairly early in the process. Uh, I don't even believe I had a tier 3 skill on the captain at this point, considering I just got the ship. But perhaps, you know, as you move down the tech tree, uh, focusing on those AA skills kind of become a problematic position for, you know, British battleships. Unlike, you know, the situation with Japanese battleships and American battleships, because, you know, there are a couple of skills that might be beneficial for you to choose, you know. I mean, such as the inertial fuse for uh, HE shells, which, you know, give your HE shells more penetration. Uh, you know, consider the natural standard potency, even stock, uh, these shells have. You know, you can without a doubt see uh, the benefit of being able to penetrate more armor and make better use of the Alpha Strike. Founder. 
Or you can consider, you know, the tier 3 skill, uh, Demolition Expert, which, uh, give you a greater fire chance. Not a bad thing, consider, you know, the ship already has a pretty good fire chance. One thing you will come to realize, you know, with British battleships, is the fact that, you know, uh, on one side, you don't get as many, uh, of those super high, uh, alpha strike, uh, high damage rolls when it comes to, uh, Citadel penetrations, but your consistent number of normal penetrations, as well as your solid high explosive hits and the fires you start, uh, really add up. In many situations, the enemy just simply have no ways to deal with it. So originally, I I set up more. Uh, replays for the Orion, but then, you know, end of the day, I found them to be more mundane, and then decided to dedicate the second half of today's replay, or should I say video, on uh, the HMS Iron Duke at Tier 5. I guess, you know, getting to play the ship so soon was kind of unexpected. Uh, probably because I did, uh, or should I say, I satisfied the requirement for uh, of all the missions for, you know, British battleships that was ongoing in-game. Uh, I guess I was awarded, or should I say, rewarded with these ships by uh, Wargaming. So it just so happens that, you know, one day I signed on to the game and they were sitting in port. <laughs> Didn't pay a penny for these. So for a while I thought that, you know, I got a free Orion, but I have to grind for the Iron Duke. And quickly that turned out not to be the case. Cause uh, about a, a day or two after that, uh, I found this ship sitting in my port also. It is what it is. So I guess, you know, uh, the Iron Duke was historically uh, one of the subsequent slash successor classes uh, of battleship to uh, the Orion. It's also considered to be a super dreadnought. This was essentially the very last class of British battleships that used the 13.5 inch guns before uh, the Royal Navy moved on to the 15 inches you get on the Queen Elizabeth class as well as the Revenge class, along with many of the other ships that come after this historically. Uh, the main armament for this ship, you know, when it comes to hard stats, very much performs the same as, um, as the Orion. Because they are the same in design and practice. Uh, so you're dealing with five double of uh, 13.5 inch uh, main battery guns, uh, all mounted in the center line, uh, two turret in the front, super firing, two turret in the rear, super firing, and also a midship turret. And uh, in practice, their accuracy could be slightly better because you know, the ship is a tier higher, but I guess the degree of RNG you have to the ship kind of makes things uncertain. Uh, they also have the same reload at 30 seconds, and they have the same rotational speed at you know, 72 uh, seconds for uh, 180 degrees. But being a tier 5 battleship, you are able to, you know, essentially mount a, uh, I guess, uh, the, the aim improvement module, if you will, on the ship, which, you know, buffs your accuracy, not just for the main armament, but also for the secondary armament as well. So in practice, you know, the Iron Duke kind of shoots a little better than the Orion. In terms of mobility, uh, Iron Duke is very much like the Orion. Uh, it does about 22 and a half knot in a straight line. It turns about as well. Uh, in terms of armor, they have essentially the same main armor belt thickness, uh, same relatively well protected underwater citadel. Uh, I believe the torpedo protection might be a little better because uh, the Iron Duke is a tier 5. And Iron Duke does have more health than the Orion. 
his ultimate was too cool. He was a heavier ship, a longer ship, that simply had more displacement. Uh, so, you know, I guess perhaps the greater length the ship possesses over the Orion renders the ship relatively more vulnerable to uh, torpedo strikes, if you will. In terms of AA firepower, uh, the Iron Duke is better than the Orion, but still not a standout. I mean, you know, at tier 5, the Japanese Congo uh, gets the 25mm uh, auto cannons as their uh, short and mid range AA gun, which is better than what the Japanese ship had before it. Uh, the American New York it started to get uh, the standard combination of the 20mm Orlikan, 40mm ball force, as well as uh, 5 inches uh, triple tier combination that American ships all have, even up to tier 10. And of course, you know, uh, this ship is nowhere near uh, anything like, you know, the USS Texas, which is obviously an AA standout. But, um, I guess, you know, overall, when it comes to AA, the ship might as well be good enough. But, uh, yeah, at the same time, the A performance remains one of its vulnerabilities. But also consider the fact that you're a tier 5, which means you'll see tier 4 up to tier 7. Uh, you are starting to get some pretty solid and air power escorts. So be sure to make use of those. The ship is on fire! And another thing to note is the fact that uh, like the German Koenig at tier 5, uh, the Iron Duke doesn't carry any aircraft, whether uh, you're talking about a spotter or a fighter aircraft. Which, you know, which means, you know, you couldn't get a range extension if you wanted to, and you couldn't uh, get anti-aircraft help from your catapult fighter uh, to, you know, perhaps at least scramble and scatter uh, the drop pattern for enemy torpedo bombers as well as dive bombers, which could come in handy if, uh, if the pilot for your uh, cable fighter is not drunk. And unfortunately, the guy often is. But, you know, I suppose the Navy probably didn't pay him enough. <laughs> you know how it is. As you can see, you know, sometimes, you know, knowing when how to start a fire on an enemy target is key in this ship. Because your fire chance is so high and, you know, you routinely shoot high explosive shells. Uh, sometimes, you want to pay attention to whichever enemy have used their repair consumable. And their consumables on cooldown. And you want to shoot them and start a fire and, you know, they can easily burn for a minute. And they couldn't do a thing about it. Another difference between... Uh, the Iron Duke versus the Orion is the fact that uh, the Orion essentially has a uh, secondary armament system that's, uh, that relies on essentially 102mm guns, which is 4 inch guns. So that means you know they, they reload fairly quickly, but they have a limited range and uh, they shoot high explosive shells, I believe. So they might start fires, but most times because they're poor RNG, they're harmless to the enemy. On the Iron Duke, the situation is kind of different, but also the same. Uh, the Iron Duke's anti-surface secondary armament, which are located in the casemates along uh, the upper hull sides, are essentially 16-inch guns. You know, 152mm guns. Uh, they fire uh, armor-piercing shells. So that means, you know, if you do manage to hit enemies and they didn't overpan, they didn't miss, uh, your ship is capable of more damage. But you know, in practice, the RNG on those sh guns are not great. So they are not something to rely on. Uh, in other words, you know, this ship is ultimately not a German battleship. Which obviously, you know, starting at the Kaiser at tier 4, even the Nassau at tier 3, and especially and particularly starting with the Koenig at tier 5, can really, you know, do a lot with their secondary armament. Uh, Unfortunately, that's not really the case. Uh, I mean, the, the accuracy is not great. The RNG is not that good. Uh, 
Like the penetration hypothetically can hurt cruisers, but they're not really consistent and accurate enough to do that in practice. Um, so in a sense, you know, the secondary armament is kind of like how Japanese secondaries or American secondary behave at this tier, which means they might do uh, something, but really not a lot. Uh, it's pretty to look at, but you know, when the going gets tough, they're probably not going to save you. And you know, going back to the AA, I would say that you know, uh, the the dual 102 millimeter uh, dual-purpose guns remain. But this is essentially the first British battleship that comes with, uh, I guess, the two-pounder pound pounds uh, in quad as well as um, octo slash eight mounts, if you will. Which helps a little bit, but you know, unlike the Bofors, they have a limited range of, I believe, 2.5 kilometers without any uh, captain skills or uh, upgrade modules. So in other words, you know, in practice, they might do more to dive bombers than to bombers, and unfortunately, they will probably do more to the enemies uh, after they have already dropped their ordnance, and you know, which is too late, unfortunately. As you can see right here, in a sense, my lock is running out uh, because, you know, at this point, I'm essentially facing off uh, the enemy, King George V, which is obviously a success to my ship, uh, two tiers up at tier 7. The ship is on fire. Unfortunately, but, you know, nature of the game, tier 5 is the first tier in which you're going to see two tiers up, uh, as far as the matchmaker is concerned. Or perhaps this is, you know, also opportunity for me to show you how well this ship can do, even when you know, the situation is at its worst. As you can see, the King George V uh, also has pretty solid uh, high explosive shell uh, performance. Uh, guy hit me and did pretty solid damage. And uh, his first salvo star two fires, and two fires is really gonna do down. And you know, you don't want to wait for the enemy to reload and then, you know, use repair. Because by then, half the fires, the region would have uh, occurred, or should I say, took place. But then, you know, I use a repair and then the enemy shoots me and starts another fire. And you see, I couldn't do anything about it. That's, you know, that's a very important tactic you want to employ in a, a British battleship. But, I guess look on the bright side, uh, you know, my high explosive shells also did a lot on the enemy. So much so that, you know, I essentially straddled his superstructure and roasted the him. And even though I'm burning, uh, he's been sunk. And I would say that, you know, a uh, battleship of many other uh, nations in the game really have trouble, uh, you know, hurting their counterpart two tiers up. I mean, you know, you can look at Koenig versus the Gneisno. You can look at um, the New York versus the Colorado. You can look at the Congo versus the Gato. Uh, you know, those ships aren't really in the same weak spots. You can say the same thing about my ship, but you know, it's capable of putting up hell of a fight. And you know, I guess for you know, other battleship drivers, it's kind of unthinkable. But it kind of goes to show how solid the ship is. And perhaps you know, if you haven't started this line at this point, you'd be a good line to start, because ultimately it's fun and rewarding. Obviously, I would say that, you know, veteran battleship drivers can uh, have a lot of fun and do pretty well uh, with this line. 
but then also new battleship drivers, especially uh, traditional cru ship, uh, cruiser drivers, can uh, really benefit from uh, the fire mechanic as well as HE mechanic uh, the British battleship have, which is kind of similar to many of the cruisers. But then, you know, with their decent mobility and good armor, they're also pretty forgiving. Which I think, you know, is obviously a big trait, an important trait for uh, cruiser drivers. And unfortunately, you know, I ultimately treated my ship for three of the enemies, including uh, a tier 7. I was a little too aggressive and uh, my team was a little too slow to help. But then, you know, at the end of the day, uh, they can only do so much and sometimes incompetence is not deliberate. They just can't help it. Or much rather you can be like this guy sitting in this Colorado, uh, which is a ship with decent firepower and pretty good armor, but his ship is just so slow. He just couldn't get into position to uh, collaborate with the rest of my team. And I will say that in this situation, I totally lucked out because uh, my team has a uh, Saipan, which is tier 7 carrier. Uh, it's a premium and, you know, it's relatively controversial because too many players, the ship's overpowered and being a uh, premium ship that's purchased with cash, uh, a lot of people see the ship as a pay to win. Because, you know, even though it's a tier 7 carrier with a limited uh, hangar capacity and smaller squadrons, uh, it not only gets tier 9 aircraft, which is a fast, powerful, and uh, durable, but also that's actually one of the very, essentially one of the only American carriers that can field uh, fighters and torpedo bombers simultaneously without employing uh, dive bombers. In other words, it's potential to maximize its effectiveness when it comes to air superiority as well as surface strike, it's second to now. Had to mention that because, you know, if you are in Iron Duke and the enemy has a Saipan with two tour bomber squadrons and two fighters, uh, you are essentially free food. You are essentially like a raw turkey sitting in the oven ready to be cooked. So last but not least, I would say that, you know, the very last replay for today's video is fairly mundane, but uh, I also see this as a pretty uh, meaningful demonstration of what the ship is capable of. Uh, it really speaks loudly and clearly about how strong the ship is, and I will show you why. So to start, I decided to uh, go to the western side of the map because uh, the area is more of an open ocean rather than uh, the straight slash choke point on the east side, which means you know uh, you're going to be less susceptible to uh, ambushes by enemy uh, destroyers as well as airstrikes by uh, the enemy aircraft carrier. Which, you know, despite my good uh, HE performance and good gun handling, uh, you know, I'm still in a vulnerable position. And of course, when it comes to airstrikes, uh, my position is very much compromised. So, you know, sometimes uh, having a solid strategy might as well be more important than having a good tactic. Enemy force sighted on the horizon. So I will say that for a tier 5, uh, the Iron Duke has sufficient uh, range 
uh, is not gimped with the short range like some of the American battleships you're used to with low tiers, but then it's also not a Japanese battleship. Because in practice, you know, Japanese battleships starting with the Congo, uh, going all the way up to the Yamato, are all essentially capable of about 20 kilometers of uh, range. Of course, you know, uh, the Nagato can give or take do 21. I believe the Fuso can do 22 or even 23. And the Congo can do about 20, 21. Uh, I believe the Iron Duke can do about 17 to 18. Which is good enough because uh, shots fired from further away, it's too speculative. Or well, much better, you can have a pretty good aim, but then the native dispersion itself uh, can very much water down the effectiveness of your salvo. Or well, much better, your shells are high in the air long enough that the enemies could have maneuvered to avoid them. And often they do. Especially if, our, if they are sailing anything other than a battleship. They can simply turn and evade. They can obviously slow down and speed up and evade. Nothing new. And unfortunately right now, uh, my team seems to be being passive on the east side of the map. Well, on the western side of the map, uh, our ladder units such as the destroyers and cruisers kind of rush forward without uh, help. But much rather, my ship simply couldn't go faster to uh, provide support. So ultimately, this is a risky proposition. Sometimes your light units uh, rush forward too far and gets abandoned, they can simply be overwhelmed and annihilated. Meanwhile, on the other side of the map, the situation is risky because uh, if your team is being too passive, uh, the enemy can even capture the initiative of the and try to round up and engage and uh, very much destroy your team on their own terms. Obviously, ultimately, aggression might be risky, but uh, sometimes you are forcing the enemy to react rather than act. And you know, sometimes when we are doing that, you kind of give yourself a chance to uh, force the enemy to fight you on your own terms, which might be beneficial. So right now, unfortunately, I'm essentially alone on this side of the map. Uh, there's an enemy smoke screen in the front, which means there's obviously a destroyer or something with torpedoes. Not a good thing if you're sailing this ship. Um, but I felt that, you know, a, uh, a fighting retreat is better than just a plain old retreat. Uh, sometimes you want to take risks you want to make some sacrifices to, uh, to essentially scout and probe uh, enemy intentions, enemy movement, enemy positions before deciding whether to push onward or to flank or to uh, realize that you position or to retreat. In warfare, you, you want your action to be informed. Um, sure, I mean, sometimes being spontaneous and uh, do things on a whim may be fun. But ultimately, do you want to win? Do you want to be responsible? I mean, do you want to do your part uh, in this? You know, it's a tricky proposition, if you will. So now, this is what I wanted to show you. Um, right now, uh, I have ran into the enemy Koenig Tier 5 German battleship very much a historical counterpart to uh, the Iron Duke. Uh, in game, the Koenig has essentially the same amount of health, 47,100. In practice, um, or should I say, in real life, the Koenig was traditionally known as a battleship that's uh, better armored, 
Um, I still have pretty good firepower despite the fact that it's armed with smaller caliber guns. Because you know German metallurgy and German engineering produced uh, higher performing and better penetrating guns than uh, I guess armor piercing projectiles despite the smaller caliber. So essentially, um, in this duel, um, it's 10 guns versus 10 guns, 12, cali 12 uh, inch caliber versus 13.5 caliber, which I say inch caliber. Uh, in terms of armor, uh, he has slightly better armor, and I'm a bigger target. And in terms of mobility, uh, because the Koenig in game has received essentially a World War II style uh, powertrain or should I say propulsion system upgrade, and it's capable of a little bit over 24 knots, which means you know he can move forward at 2 knots faster. So hypothetically, he could pull back, he could do a fighting retreat, and he has more wiggle room when it comes to maneuverability than I do. And give or take, he's essentially doing just that. You know, after taking a couple pretty solid salvos, he decided to turn away and show me his turn, which means, you know, right now his ship is very well angled. Uh, if I hit him with armor piercing shells, uh, I'll miss a bounce or shatter. But the tricky thing is the fact that, you know, because I'm in a British ship, I'm actually firing uh, high explosive shells. And, you know, sure, high explosive shells not gonna hit. The guys in the armor belt and go through and do a city damage, or do a full damage pack. But what uh, my high explosive shots will do is that it's gonna hit the stern, it's gonna hit the bow, it's gonna hit the whole of the ship above the armor belt, it's gonna hit the superstructure, uh, and any very hits, if you penetrate, it will do solid damage. Maybe not as much as uh, armor piercing, but you do solid damage. And you know, solid damage, a bounced or shattered or missed or overpanned armor piercing shell will never do. And at the same time, uh, my shells are consistently starting uh, fires and also causing massive module damage on enemy ship. So his secondary mounts and A mounts are being knocked out. And uh, he's kind of forced to uh, scramble and use his repair. So much so that after uh, a couple minutes of disengagement, despite the fact that he has, he has put away, uh, he essentially has almost no health left and is about to die. Meanwhile, I still have to give or take about 80% of my health left. You know, ultimately, at the end of the day, this is almost unthinkable because you know, these two ships are historically equivalent and uh, historically, the relatively short fuse and inconsistent armor piercing that the British ship have, uh, in practice, couldn't do much against the German battleship, as uh, as was the situation during the Battle of Jutland back in 1916. Uh, and perhaps, you know, in practice, the high explosive shell usage is kind of a bit of an afterthought. But thanks to the development of such a meta game by Wargaming, uh, I essentially made short work of the enemy German battleship. I survived to see another day. It's kind of unthinkable, almost kind of sad, because uh, I like my Koenig also. It's got good armor piercing performance. AA is okay. It turns well. It's decently fast. Uh, and the secondary is wonderful. Uh, if you get close enough to an enemy carrier, sometimes your secondary can single-handedly sink them. But uh, I guess as Wargaming has intended, you know, a uh, new ship in town can uh, do better and do more. Because it's got a couple tricks up its sleeve. Yeah. It is what it is.
So anyways, uh, once again, special bonus points for if you know where this soundtrack came from. Uh, I'm sure if you watch enough jingles, you know. <laughs> anyways, uh, the first game is essentially the very first game I played in Orion. This solid damage, got Citadel's got kills. Uh, pretty good profit. It just goes to show that, you know, the lion turned out to be very user-friendly and easy to play. And easy to adapt to and very rewarding. And very much the same things apply for the second replay in Orion, which also occurred within the first few days of me getting the ship. As with the very first replay in the Iron Duke, uh, it goes to show that, you know, the fire and high explosive shell focused metagame, it's very much effectual and uh, usable. Even if uh, the game throws at you a curveball, and uh, force you to fight against much superior enemies. And last but not, not, not the least, uh, it goes to show that, you know, the Iron Duke simply single-handedly uh, trumped and destroyed a historical equivalent and no loss to itself. <laughs> 